Hallelujah. Thank you for coming and tuning in all across the nations. We are glad to have you on our second service today to the glory of God. Amen. Please put your hands together and give him praise one more time. Say in the name of the Lord Jesus, I break down unseen barriers. I break down invisible walls and I break through them right now. Say I break through every resistance in the atmosphere. Say I break spells in the atmosphere. As I put my hands together in the name of Jesus, I command spells break in the atmosphere. Invisible walls and barriers fall, come down, break in the name of Jesus. Break in the name of Jesus. I free up the atmosphere. Let the atmosphere be freed up. Let the atmosphere be released. Release the atmosphere. Free up the atmosphere. Somebody put your hands together. Push it. Push it. Push it. Push it. Give him praise. Break the atmosphere. Free up the atmosphere. Freedom in the atmosphere. Freedom. Freedom. In the name of Jesus. We set the atmosphere loose. And free. Let the word of the Lord have a free course. Come on somebody. Put it together. Let the word have a free course. Push it. One minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. One minute. Push it. Push it. One minute. Hallelujah. Thank you. Take a second and welcome one or two people to church. Welcome one or two people to church. Say something good to them. Tell them they are looking handsome, beautiful, good. And after you do that, you can put your hands together and be seated in heavenly places. Last week, we were talking about the ongoing conflict, and we're still on it, but I want to digress a little by talking to you about the reasons for fastings and the benefits of fastings. Because I think so many people struggle with fasting because we lack understanding of the reasons why we fast and the benefits when we fast. There are reasons and there are benefits. But before we get to the reasons and the benefits, we want to go to Matthew, the ninth chapter, reading from the 14 to the 15 verse of Matthew the ninth chapter. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Then, Dola Kitola then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast oft, but thy disciples fast not? And Jesus said unto them, Can the children of the bride chamber mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken from them, and then shall they fast. So it's very clear that these are the days of fasting. Tell somebody, these are the days of fasting. These are the days of fasting. And what is fasting? Fasting, fasting is simply abstaining from food for spiritual purposes. You abstain for food to give God an undivided attention. Say hallelujah. 
And so it's very clear here that the disciples, uh, and they said to Jesus, how come the disciples of John and the Pharisees are fasting and your disciples are not fasting and they are eating? And he said, there will come a time and there will come a day when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. And it's very clear to you and I that Jesus has been taken up for 2,000 years now. And since then, since he was taken up, we have to fast until he comes again. So fasting is it's, it's, it's mandatory. It's a requirement. It's something that God expects of you and I as believers that we fast. Amen. Come with me to Matthew 6, 17 and 18. Matthew 6, 17 and 18. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in, secret, in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So here, it's clear that God expects us to fast. He didn't say if you fast, he said when. So it's something that is expected and required of you and as believers to fast irrespective of how many years you've been in the Lord and how strong your faith is, how gifted and how anointed you are. Fasting is mandatory and is required of every believer by God until the day of Jesus Christ and until the day you die. Fasting is required and there are reasons for fasting and benefits of fasting. Say, I hear you. Mark chapter 9 verse 29. And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing, but by prayer and fasting. So it's very clear here that you can be gifted, you can be anointed, you can have strong faith, you can have great faith, but there are certain situations, it's only fastings that can move it. So it doesn't matter how gifted, how anointed, how great your faith is, if you don't fast to tackle certain stubborn situations, they will not change and they will continue to be there. So it's very clear. Jesus Christ prescribed it. It's a, it's, a, it's a spiritual prescription that there are certain conditions, situations, and stubborn situations that it requires and it takes fastings to turn it around. I declare that within these 30 days of fast, you will experience divine encounters and divine turnaround. If you believe it, put your hands together and say yes. Put your hands together and say yes. Come on, say yes. Say yes if you believe it. So you can be so gifted, so anointed, have strong faith, great faith, and it doesn't matter how gifted and anointed. If you don't fast, there are certain situations that you can never turn it around. Jesus prescribed it. Come with me to Acts 13, 2 and 3. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas, and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. You see, so they fasted twice. They fasted, they fasted, and they prayed. And as they fasted and prayed, the Holy Spirit spoke to them. The Holy Spirit did not speak until they fasted. I remember when I lived in America for eight years, just when I was beginning to rise as a star on TBN, Daystar, Inspirational Channel, the Word Network, and, and I was all over the place, and God was beginning to elevate me all over the place. During the time of fasting, the Lord spoke to me and said, go back to Ghana. I need you. Your people need you. Go back to Ghana. Go back to Africa. I, I will hold you responsible for what happened in, in Ghana and your continent, not America. So go back home. And it, it was a time when everything was beginning to work out for me after many years. And, and I remember a guy came to see me and he said, listen, I've been watching you and there's nobody who has what you have to offer. This prayer ministry and the supernatural, he said, from the day after the days of Larry Lee, nobody has it on the scene. So I, I, can, I, can, I can work with you and I will manage you, you know, and, and, and I will market your ministry and whatever come in, we will make money and I'll take a percentage. And, and it was very, very tempting, you know, very, very tempting. And yet the Lord said, go back to Africa. And I didn't have much going for me back here, but it was at a time of fasting that the Lord said, go back home. 
And so I decided to come back and he said, just take your suitcase and go home. So I took my suitcase and I came back. But then I told the guys, I said, uh, pack all my things in the house and, and put, it, uh, 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 put it on the ship and ship it to Ghana. And they had about three 40-foot containers, load of things, all kinds of stuff I had. And I was looking forward to have it and up to today it never came. Uh, we couldn't find it. And I said, let's sue the company. The company declared bankruptcy. And so I never had it, but God has given me more than what I had when I live in America. Are you hearing me? I remember, I remember 30 years ago when I was offered five acres of land at Fadama. And the Lord said, don't take the church there. Uh, I have a place for you. And I didn't know where it was. So I went to Alaji, uh, Alaji at that time, Cuba. Um, Alaji, he was, then the, um, he was then in charge of the lands commission about Cuba. And I said, Alaji, uh, assalamu alaikum. And he said, alaikum salam. And I said that uh, I can't accept this uh, offer. I need somewhere else. And he said, Osofo, there is no land in the city. There's nothing. You have to go outside and cry. And I say, I don't mind, but, but I can't go there. And so I, I gave him back the document for the five acres at Fadama. And I went into a fast. I remember during the time of the fast, before the fast ended, he called me. And he said, Osofo, come, I want to show you something. And he brought me to this land. And he said, this land is, is there. You can have it if you don't mind. I said, yes, I, I can have it. And already my father had a dream. And he, he was driving through this place. And he saw everything that is here today. And he told me, I had a dream. And in the dream, I saw this huge church. And there was a bank and this and that. And he described everything here that did, was not there at the time that he had a dream. And he said, well, sorry, no, your church, don't take it to town. Take it to that place. And I didn't like this place because when we came here from ShopRite to Sakumono Junction, there was nothing here except the Bank of Ghana warehouse and spin tech. That was it. Those two things, nothing else. And we lost so many people for coming here. Nobody wanted to come to this area. But it was in the time of fasting that this place came up. And we moved to this place. And as tough and as difficult as it was during that time, the Lord said, if you move the church to that desert place you call, I will move the city to you. I will bring the city to you. And if you move on the Sprinkler's Road today, the city has come to this place. Put your hands together and thank God for that. So many major, major, major things that have happened and taking place in my life were things that happened when I deliberately focused on, on fasting and, and on prayers, not just praying, but fasting specifically, deliberately over certain matters and issues for a breakthrough and God will always come through for you and I say, I hear you. Somebody say, talk to me, talk to me. Come with me to Isaiah 58 and verse 6. Let's look at some of the reasons for fasting. It's not this the fast that I have chosen to lose the bands of wickedness. So number one, we fast to lose the bounds of wickedness. I'm telling you, there's wickedness in this world. There is wickedness in family, household wickedness. Wickedness at the marketplace. Wickedness on the political scene. Wickedness on the financial scene, on the social scene. There is wickedness all over the place. And the Bible says, for when we fast, God said, I will lose the bounds of wickedness. If you believe that, put your hands together. And during these 30 days of fasting, I look forward to losing the bounds of wickedness. See, I hear you. Number two, go on. To undo the heavy burdens. To undo heavy burdens. There are people carrying heavy burden, load, excess luggage. The enemy is exacting on them, afflicting them, putting them down, holding them down in marriages, in relationships, in, in families, in all kinds of ways. They are under a burden. It's an embargo and a weight on them. And the Lord said, if you fast for these reasons, if you fast for the right reason, you will see burdens lifted. I pray that within these 30 days, burdens will be lifted in the name of Jesus. Put your hands together and say, I command the lifting of burdens. 
burdens be lifted in the name of Jesus. Go ahead. And to let the oppressed go free. The oppressed go free. Oppressed. There are people held at ransom, held in captivity, held in bondage. And during the time of fasting, we proclaim freedom and we proclaim liberty to the captives. Freedom to those that are held in prison. In the name of Jesus, home and abroad, any kind of imprisonment from mental to emotional to spiritual to financial to marital to family, whatever the oppression and the captivity is, we proclaim in the name of Jesus doing this fast. Freedom, 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 freedom at home, freedom at the marketplace, freedom in our relationship, freedom for our sons and our daughters, freedom for the captives, freedom for those in prison. Put your hands together. Freedom. Somebody declare freedom. Proclaim freedom. Freedom to the captives. Freedom at, for those held at ransom. Freedom. Freedom. The African American said the other day, thank God Almighty, free, free, free at last, free at last. Let somebody within these 30 days of fasting be set free. Let somebody go free. Let the prison doors be open and let the captives go free. Let prisoners of hope go free. Let prisoners of war go free. We declare freedom. We proclaim freedom in the heavens above and the earth beneath over every dwellings and over every family. At the hospital, at the hospital, at the marketplace, at the prisons, we proclaim freedom. 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 Somebody say freedom. Oh, I can't hear. Somebody say freedom. Freedom. Somebody announce freedom. Somebody proclaim freedom. Somebody put your hands together and say freedom. Freedom. Freedom everywhere. Freedom. 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 Go ahead. And that ye break every yoke. Break every yoke. There are yokes. There are yokes. Shackles of wickedness. Chains. Padlocks. Uh -huh. On people. Yoke. People have been yoked. Emotionally. Financial yokes. Mental and emotional yokes. Spiritual yokes. All kinds and types of yokes. That will not be broken by the confession of faith only and by prayer only and by anointing only or by giftings only through the times and the seasons of fasting yokes are broken I declare within these 30 days by the word of the Lord let every yoke be broken let yokes be broken yokes in our lives yokes in our marriages yokes in the life of the seed of the righteous let yokes be broken put your hands together and say I command every yoke broken I command every yoke to break I command yokes to be broken let yokes, let yokes every yoke, let it be broken break, all yokes break, financial yokes break, mental yokes break psychological yoke break marital yokes break spiritual yokes break political yokes break call the yokes broken put your hands down command it to break yokes break yokes be broken in the name of Jesus amen come with me to Psalm 35 and the 13th verse here was David talking about how he humble his soul by fasting. Right. But as for me, when they were sick, my clothing was sackcloth. I humbled my soul with fasting. So, fasting is one of the ways we humble our soul because the soul is very arrogant. The soul is very proud. The soul seeks for recognition. The soul is always in conflict with the spirit. The soul seeks and wants dominance over your spirit. And the spirit also seeks dominant over the soul. The soul is very, very deceptive and very powerful. But through fasting, we, we silence the details and the cravings and the demands uh, of the soul and of the body. Uh, fasting is powerful. Through fasting, we humble ourselves. And God said, if you humble yourself, I will exalt you. One of the things God detested and, and cannot stand is pride. Pride and arrogance. God can't stand it. And 
through fasting, we humble ourselves. And every now and then, it is required and expected of you and I to humble our soul under the mighty hand of God that God may exalt us in due season. Put your hands together and thank God for that. Amen. Go ahead. First Timothy 4 and 15. Verse 8. Yeah, verse 8. First For Timothy bodily 4. exercise profit of little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that is now and of that which is to come. So godliness, fasting is, is part of our godly walk and is part of godliness. Fasting is spiritual exercises. Just as bodily exercise profited a little and fasting is part of our godly walk and our service to God. Somebody say, I hear you. Yeah. Let's look at some of the benefits. Come to um, Isaiah chapter 58. Uh, from verse 8 to 12. See the benefits. We've seen the reasons why we must fast. Let's look at some of the benefits when we fast. Then thy shall light. thy light break forth as the morning. Thy light. That, that, re, that talks about illumination, revelation, insight, sight, vision. Your light will break forth. Break forth. Your light will break forth. You will not walk in darkness or in obscurity. You will not lack knowledge and understanding and insight and revelation and foresight. You will have light. You will have illumination. Uh, I was talking to them this morning when we were praying that we need to reclaim the keys of revelation. The Bible says, woe unto you lawyers, for you have taken away the keys of revelation. And I said, we must repossess and reclaim the keys of revelation. Everything we do in this life that we succeed and break through in has to do with light. It's all about light. It's all about revelation. And some of the benefits of fasting is that God will enlighten your darkness and will give you a greater light, revelation, and illumination, and sight, and insight, and give you keys of revelation to unlock things and to demystify mysteries. Say, I hear you. You. Number two, go ahead. And thine health shall spring forth speedily. There is benefit even for your health when we fast. It does something to your health. It helps you to be healthy. Fasting makes you healthy. That is if you fast right, especially drinking water so you don't get dehydrated and you are flushing out the toxins and everything from your body. Fasting one of the benefits of fasting is good health when you do it the right way. Go ahead. And thy righteousness shall go before thee. Righteousness has to do with right standing. And there are two kinds of righteousness. Imputed righteousness and fulfilled righteousness. Fulfilled righteousness. Fasting is fulfilled righteousness. Okay. And giving is fulfilled righteousness. But true righteousness, it's imputed when it comes to right standing with God or before God has everything to do with the blood that Jesus shed for you and I. It has nothing to do with our good works. And the other day, Jacob said that, my righteousness shall speak for me in the times to come. Eh? And uh, there are a lot of things that happen to us in life that we must come to the place of understanding imputed righteousness. That is not about what we do wrong or right, but it's have everything to do with what Jesus has done and the blood that was shed. I've been dealing with some things and going through a lot of things and Sometimes people can say, Papa, what are you going to do? Uh, uh, are you still going to do this, Papa? We are waiting. We, we, we want you to do something. I said, no, 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 no. I don't act in times of confusion and, and in storms. I have to be led by the Spirit. And I don't operate by, by fear. For the Bible says anything that is done without faith is sin. And when I'm afraid, I don't take decisions. Uh, when, when there's trouble and, and storms and chaos, I don't act. Because any action leads to a reaction. And sometimes the enemy will want a reaction from us. He wants an action so he can react. So we have to be very, very wise. Especially in times of turbulence. We need, as children of God, we need to be very, very, very prayerful. And very sensitive to the Holy Spirit. Because it is very easy for you to just act in the light of what's going on around. But as a child of God, you must understand something that is God that we are dealing with. And when it comes to our reputation, we have to trust God with our reputation. 
You know, we have to trust God with our reputation. Uh, the, the Bible said that Jesus was of no reputation. He emptied himself of reputation. And Jesus said the other day, Woe are you if all men speak well of you. You are not a good disciple. And so sometimes we are tempted to be in the good books of people. But you got to be careful. You have to be very careful because you can be in the good books of people and displease God if you acted out of faith and you acted you know, to prove a point, you don't need to prove any point. You just have to come to a place where you know that my relationship with God is straight, my motive is right, and my heart is pure towards God. And if anybody attempts or tries anything contrary to God's will, Adolamida kuwasa esalakutun kefasumba lahadaya lahun suki mahadisa The blood of Jesus will answer for you. Put your hands together. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re reward. The glory of the Lord shall be your reward. His glory shall be a shield, your reward. Hallelujah. That is part of the benefits when we fast. Go ahead. Then shall thou call and the Lord shall answer. He said, he said I, will come, I will come through for you speedily. Just when you begin to call, I will show up. I will show up. Go ahead. Thou shalt cry and he shall say, here I am. He said, as soon as tears flows through your eyes, I will show forth. Hallelujah. Go ahead. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger. The yoke. The yoke. Breaking the yoke in the midst of thee. And then he said, the putting forth of finger. He's it, talking about accusing one another. And especially being critical of others. Being judgmental. Judging others, pointing finger at others, always finding fault and seeing something wrong with others, being critical of others. You, you just can't do that. And that has a way of putting God away from the mix of art. It grieves the Holy Spirit. It does. There are six things that are abomination, and yea, the seventh. Uh, before God, God said, I hate these six things and the seven is an abomination. What is the seven which is an abomination? He said, those who sow discord, conflict, strife among brethren. There are things I know that I will not repeat it to another. Uh, some marriage couples will come and this one will say this and this one will say and when I meet both of them, I will not repeat what anyone said because if I'm not careful, that thing can lead to a major problems for them. So I don't repeat it. I, I just listen and I try to help as much as I can. You, you got to have wisdom. And he said, pointing a finger, speaking ill of one another, being critical of others. You, you must be a peacemaker. For blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Not strive makers. Uh, not those who divide uh, the brethren and bring conflict among brethren. Pointing a finger. Always finding fault with others. And being critical of the mistakes of others and what people wear and what they come to church with. All those things. Tell somebody, mind your own business. Mind your own business. Yeah, yeah. Stop looking around. Stop always trying to find fault with others and trying to be the personal Holy Spirit of others. Yeah, yeah. Stop it. Amen. Let the Holy Ghost, let the Holy Ghost convict people. Even with my own children, it's not everything I talk about. There are things I just leave it alone. I just leave it alone. I trust God because if I don't let the Holy Spirit convict and I try to step in, all it does is to just bring conflict and confusion. I just leave it and I say, Spirit of the living God, you, you handle it. You are the one that convict. I have nothing to say until you intervene and you step in. There's not much you can do about it. One of the things that the Bible says will happen in the end time is that children will be disobedient to parents. Parents. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you have children, you are a parent. You can be a bishop, a prophet, an archbishop, a pope, or whatever. It don't matter who you are. If you are a parent, that spirit of disobedience will fight you too. It's against everyone who is a parent. He fought God in heaven, is here on earth, it will fight every parent. So your job is to take a stand against the spirit of disobedience and rebuke it in the name of Jesus. That's all you can do. You fight it, you hit it. That's all you can do. If you're a parent, you will deal with the spirit of disobedience. If you don't deal with it in the kids, it will come up with your grandkids. The enemy is not the respecter of who you and I, you know, 
is. He will hit anybody because that is what he does. Spirit of ingratitude, unthankfulness. It's a spirit. It's a spirit that will operate in the last days through our kids, through those we love and care for the most. And it's one of the ways the enemy also can distract us. Because I was telling somebody, and I said it at the first service, that most times when you see the enemy trying to throw something at me, he's always doing Kairos moments of my life. During the time of impact, some important times of my life, like these 30 days are when I need concentration to focus, to really deal with issues and stand in the gap for people and nations and my nation. Then something just comes up. Things just comes up from nowhere. But they are all calculations. And the reason why they come up is because the enemy wants to distract me. He wants my attention so he can give me direction. Whatever you give attention, you pay attention to will determine your directions. And whatever determine your direction will determine the outcome of your life and your circumstances. And the greatest challenge we all face is to be able to stand your ground in the midst of the distraction and say, no, God, I trust you and I believe you. Are you hearing me, somebody? And you see, go to Hosea chapter 1, uh, Hosea chapter 7. Go to Hosea chapter 7. Can you hear me? Bishop is holding my scriptures. From our dear mommy, or suffer. From our dear mommy. Somebody say, or suffer. From our dear mommy. From our dear mommy. Amen? Okay, go to Hosea 1 7. Look at something here. 7 1. Hosea chapter 1, chapter 7, verse 1. Look at when I would have healed Israel, then, the, iniqu uh -huh. then the iniquity of Ephraim was discovered. Stop there. You see, this scripture, eh? Is heavy, it's low dead. When did the iniquity of Ephraim discovered? When? When God would have healed Israel. When? When God would have healed Israel. You see, the iniquity of Ephraim is something to do with your bloodline from your fathers and something, a covenant, an iniquity. Iniquity here means lawlessness, transgression. Of the law of God. There's some transgression of the law of God in your bloodline, in your father's house and in your mother's house. That is there. And the enemy will never bring it up until at a Kairos moment or the prime of life. And he brings it up. Now here, this is the fact here. This is what believers don't know. He's always going to bring it up. Just before a major turnaround and a major breakthrough in your life. Now, he brings it up and believers get confused that have I not revoked the curse? Have I not dealt with this curse in my blood now? It's not about dealing with the curse. Few things you must understand. It's not just dealing with the covenant or dealing with the demonic decree like Haman did. Haman died and the decree he put in place against the Jews was still in place. Now, it's not just the decree. It's also the demonic policemen. Because the decree cannot affect itself. It has to be affected by the law enforcement agents of God. So demons have the responsibility to enforce a particular law and decree and pattern and covenant in a bloodline. So we have the strong man and we also have the familiar spirit of the family. So you are dealing with a decree. You are dealing with the strong man. You are dealing with the familiar spirit who has the information and the history of that bloodline and will provoke the strong man at a particular time in your life just before you break through, just before you are healed. He brings up an iniquity. What do you do when the iniquity comes up? Go to Psalm 107 verse 2. Look at Psalm 107 verse 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. So when do you... Watch this, watch this. The Bible says, let the redeemer of the Lord say what? Say so. So when do you say so? You say so as a counter petition or as a counter decree or as a counter objection. When the enemy brings up the iniquity of your father's house and of your mother's house, and trying to subject you to it, you say, hey, 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 listen, I'm not ignorant of that thing. It exists, but I am exempted because I'm redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I don't even have to break it. I don't even have to fight it. But you can. 
But you can get to a place and say, you know something, I'm not going to engage you in this. I'm not going to engage in warfare and battle over this issue. I am exempted by the blood of the Lamb. I have another identity. Are you hearing me, somebody? I have changed my citizenship. So I am not subject to the laws of this country because I have another citizenship and I am subject to the law of my new citizenship. So even though what you are saying is true and has effect on the men and the women of that bloodline, because I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb and I am declaring my new identity, I am making a counter declaration and a counter objection, a counter petition. You can't hold me at ransom based on that law, based on that decree, because I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb from the hand of the enemy, and I say so. Say so means I'm declaring my new identity. Please understand that the enemy we are dealing with is a bully. And it's relentless. Even though you've been set free, he's not just going to give up easily. He will find ways to always come back at you. He will. The spirit of Pharaoh. They were delivered from the land of Egypt. But he pursued. He still went after them. The fact that you are born again and Holy Ghost filled and you are a Shandamite and a Shidamite don't mean the enemy is going to leave you alone. Are you hearing me somebody? He will come after you. The devil don't spend his time on territories he has already conquered. He's interested in territories he hasn't yet taken and conquered. Why are you looking at me that way? Bishop, I don't understand your people. They are soaking it in. Ah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come with me. Come with me. Look at, look at Matthew 12. 43 to 45. Matthew 12. Mm -hmm. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man. When what? The unclean spirit is gone, gone out of a man. It's gone out of a man. Gone out of you and I. Nobody was born with righteousness and holiness. Hear me. The Bible says it was in, in iniquity that my mother conceived me. We were all conceived in iniquity. So don't tell me about your right to me. I never smoked before. I never did. I never did that before. It doesn't matter. All have seen and have come short of the glory of God. And you had a demon before you got born again. Before the Holy Ghost came, you had an unclean spirit. Tell somebody, stop it. You had an unclean spirit before. Everybody had an unclean spirit before you got born. And the unclean spirit knows you, your identity, your strength, and your weaknesses. And it's not going to let go easily. Every now and then it will come back at you. Go ahead, look at it. When the unclean spirit has gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, uh -huh. seeking rest, and uh -huh. findeth none. Mm -hmm. Then he saith, I will return into my house from return whence to I where? came. My house. Return to where? My house. Tell somebody, do you know demons and unclean spirit call you their house? You. No, I know you haven't thought about that before, but I'm just telling you. I know you are very anointed. And very gifted. And I know you are a Shidamite and a Shandamite. Shida, 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 Shanda, 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 Shanda. Uh -huh. But I'm telling you, with all your Shanda and your Shida, 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 demons call you their house. They know you very well. They know how you pretend. They know everything about you. I remember some years ago, I had a spiritual daughter in this. She was very annoyed, eh? And she used to prophesy a lot in those days when we were at the airport. And she said, my children, my children, my children, <laughs> my children, my children, my children, say the Lord, say the Lord, say the Lord. And she was very, very accurate. Then one day her husband came to me and said, Papa, I want to report your daughter to you. Every time we come to church, my children, my children, my children, my children, why I know who's spiritual. In the bedroom, she doesn't say my children, my children. You should see her, that what she does. And then she said, Jai are you not my husband? Somebody say, I hear you. But, but this, hear me, these are demons speaking. They are saying that you belong to me. You are born again, but I'm not letting go. I'm not letting go. 
Israel was set free from captivity and Pharaoh pursued them through the Red Sea. He won't let go. Even when God drowned Pharaoh in the Red Sea, some of the children of Egypt followed them. We call them the mixed multitude. That was the reason why a lot of them didn't make it to the promised land. Turn to someone and say, who is following you and what is following you? Go ahead, Bishop. I will return into my house from whence I came out. You see? You see? Tell somebody. Do you know that demons have a plan to come back into your life? No, tell somebody. I'm giving you mandate to do it. Yeah, tell them Papa is giving me authority to speak to you. I'm not afraid of you. I have authority from Papa to speak to you. Yeah, yeah. Do you know demons have a plan to come back? Why is you are trying to please God? Mind your own business. Serve the Lord. Demons have a plan to come back. Say, demonic, come back. You think you're minding your own business? They want to come back. They want access. They want an occasion to come back. And unbelief, disobedience, doubt, and sin will give them the legal grounds to come back. Lift up your hands. Say, in the name of Jesus. I strip and deny the enemy any legal grounds through the blood of Jesus to come back into my life. I deny him. I strip and block him right now. Put your hands down. Deny him. Strip him of any legal ground given to him to come back through doubt, unbelief, fear, sin, disobedience, frustration, anger, Whatever it is, block him, deny him, in the name of Jesus, deny him. Thank you, Lord. Let's finish our scripture, 43 to 45. Uh -huh. I will return I will into return. my house from whence I came and when he is come, uh -huh. he findeth it empty, swept and garnished. Uh -huh. Then goeth he and taketh with him. You see, so it is dangerous, very dangerous, to be born again and not to be filled with the Spirit. And when it comes to being filled with the Spirit, it's a continuous thing. Tell somebody, keep being filled. Keep being come on, filled. talk to me. Say, keep being filled. Keep being, keep filled. being filled. Keep being filled. Keep being filled. Sometimes you'll be there and you feel down. Yeah, you feel depressed, oppressed, and you don't know what is wrong. And sometimes you feel grief. Let me tell you what it means. It means that spiritually, your water level is dropping. And that is the time you have to begin to pray in the spirit and build yourself up again because you are going down. The water level is going down. Your power is reducing. And if you keep going down, after a while, demons can invade certain areas of your life and make life more complicated and difficult for you. That's why a lot of believers can be born again and then later on in their life, you see things and you can't understand why a preacher or a believer, a man of God, a woman of God should go through that. You see, you never get to a place in your walk with God when you arrive. You can't. I wish there was a place like that. There's no place like that. I wish sometimes I don't have to pray the way I pray. And I, I wish at my age I don't have to fast. Yeah, yeah. Just say, be done. Be done. And it's done. There's nothing like that. It doesn't work. It's a continuous thing. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Yesterday, we fast from Monday to Friday. So Saturday and Sunday, I don't fast. Because I have so many things I have to do and I need my energy. But yesterday, there was something going on. I said, I need to fast and deal with this thing. Too much distraction. So I decided to fast. On Friday night, I decided on Friday. Friday night, my chef came and said, what do you want for breakfast tomorrow? I said, nothing. Then Saturday morning, the guys in the house said, Papa, uh, breakfast is ready. And I said, please, I don't want breakfast. Then I left it. Then in the afternoon, they say, lunch is ready. I say, I don't want lunch. And then about three o'clock, Papa, uh, what do you want for lunch? 
And I said, this devil is very relentless and stubborn. It's like he has no, he's not the respecter of who you are, your spirituality. And some of them who were tempting me are right. They are sitting here. They are here right now. They were pushing to feed me by force. Even though I decided um, they wanted me. And I said, what is all this temptation? And they didn't know they are tempting me. But I knew it. I knew that this is a temptation. This is a distraction. Just to remind me of food. You are looking at me. I know some of you, you don't face any temptation. Yeah, yeah. But I still deal with things. You know? And I say these things because I overcome them. And I'm saying it for you to realize that the devil is not the respecter of who you are, how many years you've been in the Lord, how anointed you are, how successful. Devil is a devil. Did you hear what I said? He don't care about you. And he was our former master. And he knows how to get you. He will come back through things he knows about you just to tempt you and get you back. A lady called me the other day and said, my old boyfriend called me. And I said, what does he want? He said, oh, he said he has heard about me and how well I'm doing and he's just checking on me. And I said, it's not your old boyfriend. It's the old demon. Somebody say, an old demon. He said, Papa, how can you say that? And I said, you are not getting it. He, the devil doesn't operate in a, in a vacuum. He has to use somebody. So he's using an old boyfriend. But it's a demon speaking to you. I said, the voice you were hearing is a demon. He's just trying to look if there's an opening. Tell somebody he's looking for an opening. And he doesn't care who he uses. Yeah, an old boyfriend. Yeah, I, I've been reading about you. I, I see you on, on social media. I'm, I'm, just, I'm just trying to check you. You look so great. What have you been doing? Wow! I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. What wow? It's not any wow. Don't bewitch me. Yeah. The old man, he wants to come back. He never gives up. Never gives up. He's relentless. And you need that awareness to know that he's not the respecter of persons. He will come through anybody, especially those you love and care about and those who have access to you. I had a strange revelation this morning after I went to bed at three. Just before I woke up at five, I had this revelation where I saw some of my bishops and pastors. They come into my bedroom. Then I saw two demons sneak in when they were coming in. So I woke up and I said, hey, after all these prayers, demons are still sneaking in. So I said, I was, I was a little bit angry. And I said, Lord, what is this? And he said, you don't have to be angry. The Holy Spirit is showing you something that you need to be very alert because the enemy will try to access you through those you love the most and those you care about. He will come in through them. Because he can't come in through a vacuum. So he will find people you love and people you let down your guard with. And so that's what security, security, let them come through, let them come through. And he will sneak in. So I said, in the name of Jesus, I take a stand against demonic invasion, against people I love and I care now, and I'm against any, through anyone around me wife, children, loved one, grandchildren, bishop, pastor, prophet, I don't care who you are. I take a stand in prayer in the name of Jesus and I raise an objection deny you of access you will not enter in the name of Jesus listen when it comes to the enemy I don't pray nice prayers oh. some of you pray some very nice prayers thy will be done what will be done this is not will be done matter I know the will of God I don't pray thy will be done no 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 no, no. I broke you are you hearing me if you watch my phone, eh? if you watch my phone, I have some numbers on my phone. On my phone, devil. Some other numbers, Satan. Some other numbers, the tempter. You never know who they are. But I know why I put those names there. Because any time those numbers call me, something happens. So I know, as soon as I see devil, don't touch. 
tempter, leave it alone. Satan ran away. Now, you can look at me anywhere you want to look at me. I'm just telling you the reality of this world. I'm telling you. Yeah. The devil is not going to leave you alone till Jesus comes. That's who he is. He's a bully and a tempter. And that's what the Bible says. Let the redeem of the Lord. Whom he has redeemed from where? The hands of the enemy do what? Say, Say so. so. Because he will raise an objection at your kairos moment. When your blessing is at hand. When I would have healed Israel. Then was the iniquity of Ephraim, of Ephraim discovered. Why? When I would have healed you. He lays ambushment. Waiting for your kairos moment. When you are in the prime of your life. Then he will bring up something. As an objection to say you don't deserve it. But you got to make a counter objection. That I deserve it. Based on my new identity, I deserve it. Based on the blood that redeemed me, I deserve it. In the name of Jesus, I have divine exemptions. But one of the things that accelerates the promise is when you fast. I've been fasting, living a fasting life. If you ask me, for me, I'll say once or twice every week you fast. As much as is possible. Because of the things we are confronting and dealing with is something you have to stick with. And verse 45, verse 45 of Matthew. Then goeth he and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself. More what? Wicked. More wicked. Say it again. More wicked than so that himself. Is how this, this adversary we are dealing with is no joke. He's wicked. Huh? He's wicked. Somebody will say wicked. Call it spiritual wickedness. He doesn't relent. You can relent. Yeah. That is what it is. If the Muslims can pray five times a day all their life, and the Jews three times a day all their life, and they fast, they have Ramadan and things, you cannot quit. The Jews, every Friday, every Friday into Saturday, you know, they observe. An ordinance that have been there for thousands of years. Do you observe it? Righteously. They never get weary and tired of it. They don't compromise it. I was in um, Galilee. And a friend of mine in Israel. Very prominent person came to see me. And at a particular time, he said, Archbishop, I'm sorry I have to leave. We'll continue this later. And I said, well, we haven't finished here. I know. It's very important, but I have to leave because it's Sabbath. And at a particular time, if I hit the road and it, 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 it's Sabbath, I have to stop where I am and sleep there till the Sabbath is over. You and I, we take things for granted. If you go to Dubai or Abu Dhabi or any of these Islamic nations or Qatar, and you carry $1 million cash in your briefcase to buy things at the time of prayer, they will tell you, I'm sorry. If you can't wait for me to go and pray and come back, then my God doesn't want me to have this money. Take your money away. And walk away and go pray. We are not like that. We take too much for granted. We are. Uh-huh. Somebody say, uh-huh. You heard it. Yeah, you can look at me anyway, but that is a reaction. You can say you are too spiritual. It doesn't matter. I'm not ignorant of his devices. Are you hearing me, somebody? Are you a believer to the call? Where when money is presented to you and it's time to fast and it's time to pray, you can walk away and say, no, I'm sorry. Forget it. Let me go spend time in prayer. Let me fast. I'll come back to this later. Not now. Until we come to that place of putting more value on spiritual things than material things, you never see the glory of God. And there are some victories you never have in your life if you're a believer and you don't fast. John Wesley of the Methodist Church, they had a policy in those days that if you can't fast from 4, no, morning to 4 p.m., 
Once a week, you will not be ordained as a minister in the Methodist church. It was mandatory that in order for you to be ordained as a minister in the Methodist church in those days, you should be able to fast once a day from 6 a.m. to 4 p.m. If you can't do that, they will not ordain you. Stand on your feet. The way you are quiet, let me go and sit down. Amazing. 